My name is Emily Boardman, and I live in Chester, New York, um, and that's in Orange County. And I've worked in Orange County for the last um, about 35 years with the community of people living with the HIV virus. Uh, I would say in short that, um, and this is very short, that the community of people with the virus that I have known have been some of the most courageous and some of the most honest people that I've ever known. For a long time, I worked with people in a health environment, whether it was the Middletown Community Health Center or whether it was the uh, Newburgh Family Health Center. And again and again, my frustration was that people needed more than medical services. They needed more than um, a, an occasional support group or a nutritionist or a um, case manager. This is a community of people who are really, really isolated and felt very separate and very disconnected from community and it became clearer and clearer to me that we needed to build community. The, the, the fascinating part of that is that I was with the Ryan White uh, network for many many years and in the Hudson, upper Hudson River region and then the funding was cut and I felt very strongly that as somebody who had been very involved in that network, to lose that network was to lose one of the very few places where people actually came together in empowering and communal ways to do things together, to feel good about themselves, to feel um, that they had a very important message to bring to the world. And so when we realized the funding was going to be cut, um, Rob Marr from Touch, from the lower Hudson region, I believe asked me if I thought, since it was clear to everybody that my focus has been on community more than anything else, whether or not we should just try to keep this thing alive, even without the support of um, the funding stream. And because that has been my greatest com commitment to this community, um, I said, absolutely. Uh, we started in the 80s with a grassroots organization, and we could go back to a grassroots. So I've sort of been involved in this from literally from the beginning, one of the first people in Middletown with, diagnosed with the virus, um, I knew personally. And the virus then was AIDS. We didn't refer to it as a virus. We referred to it, to it as AIDS. We, we didn't know HIV. Um, and most of what I realized is that it was about being able to have a, a strong enough connection with that person with, with AIDS to stand by, to be there, to be um, privileged to be there. And I think, though I hadn't had a lot of experience with death and dying, I think that my father had always said that to be with the dying was to be with those who knew more about honesty and compassion and um, love than if anybody else. In life. Mm -hmm. there, yeah. About to be without it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was very real. That was really big because people would, you know, you could feel a person who was walking in such close proximity to their own mortality. 
you could feel that it gave them a understanding and a gratitude for life in a way that most people are totally asleep to. Um, so when you knew that their mortality was right there, I just knew to listen carefully. And I wanted to be in their company. I wanted to be um, privileged to uh, add. As things changed, the face of the virus changed. And in the network, that was a real challenge because when I started, it was very much a white gay men's disease. And it was a population of people who were very creative, very articulate, very ambitious, um, who had learned how to step out against the odds, had um, really struggled to get some clarity about their own intention and their own um, self-knowing that allowed them to have the courage to demand for that population a, um, a, a response from the professional world. The illness continues to be an illness of huge significance when it comes to stigma. Um, though we have medical ways of responding and pharmaceutical ways of responding to this illness, we're not doing a whole lot with the stigma. It's very wonderful for this thing to be happening right here because as you know, Ben, you and I have been talking about doing this for years and years and it's wonderful that there are really people now ready to come forward and those that I thought would come forward originally when we talked about this they are all dead. Um, they are not dying, they are not living with the virus, but they are dead. And I don't use that word casually. And why. that is very, very significant. People don't die of AIDS, but people, um, people die. This compounds, any person with a chronic condition has a whole lot of different circumstances that they have to take into consideration, whether they're caused by side effects of medication, whether it's just the early um, aging process of the body, whether it's a psychological impediment, whether it's um, having survived uh, the virus as, a, as something what, that will kill you. We, Again, I go back to community. We really need to provide something more to help people engage in life. And if they don't engage in life, they are going to take high-risk behaviors again, and we are going to see people not, not feeling the value of their life and not taking their medication adequately, not getting the support they need, feeling separated and um, almost unworthy of the hassle of being somebody living with the virus. It isn't, that it isn't just a disease for which you can take a pill. It challenges your whole world. Uh, and life is really hard under the best of circumstances. But a, Diagnosis like HIV in this world at this time up against the incredible fiscal crisis that we're facing in an environment which is challenged on so many levels. To think of this as an illness that can be treated by a pill is just a measure of your, your ignorance. Um, and I, I feel that about a number of different things. I guess it's, it comes with getting old. Older. Old. Let's get straight here. <laughs> because, um, you know, because 
youth take incredible risks, and sometimes they're worth it, and sometimes they're not. And I've certainly, uh, I certainly, a, a, a daughter of a friend just died of cancer, um, and another friend's child has just been diagnosed with leukemia, and. Um, that, those kinds of illnesses are just, um, they are life changing and life, uh, they are just compounding the challenges beyond what any of us are really prepared to address. And I would say that a safe community where you are known for who you are and what you do is as important for those living with the virus today as it was 30 years ago. Um, anybody who thinks it isn't just don't really know what it's like to um, be in, this, in, in, in the skin of a person living with the virus. I've interviewed hundreds of people with the virus. And even though there were many times when I couldn't help them, um, they would say to me again and again and again, you are the only person I've ever spoken to about this illness. I've had doctors, I've had social workers, I've had case managers, I've had nutritionists but I've never talked about what it feels like to live with this virus. Um, over and over again, people have said to me, you're talking about intimacy. And, you know, as a, as a human being, intimacy is real important. Um, and when you go there, you suddenly see that, oh no, this is not diabetes. This is... This is a different kind of a disease, and um, it, it ought to be recognized and, and treated as that. And again, I really do believe that the people that I have met with the virus and those who I have been with who died from AIDS or um, a complicating side effect um, were very very, very, very special people. And they had a message for us. And I'm very glad to have been the recipient of uh, their message and their love.